Lads, autumn is here and Manscaped, the sponsors of today's show, are here to make sure the leaves are falling off your tree as smoothly as possible. Their fourth generation performance package, which includes their signature lawnmower 4.0, has all the tools equipped to keep you calm and collected through all the weather uncertainty. Time to join the 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping with the code TRUEFOOTY20. Always remember lads, when you trim the weeds, the tree stands taller. Manscaped has the full package you need to level up your game this year. The Performance Package 4.0 is the only tool you need to keep your boys looking and smelling fresh as can be. Kick off your new routine, use the Manscaped Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer to get the most precise shave on your hedges. Did we mention it's waterproof as well? No need to worry about watering your grass with this tool. Equipped with an LED light so you know it'll be a major asset to the new shower routine. Clear your holes and smell the new season with the Weed Whacker. This nose and ear hair trimmer provides proprietary skin safe technology which prevents nicks, snags and tugs and all those delicate holes. After clearing your nose, make sure to get rid of that foul ball smell with the Crop Preserver and Crop Reviver. <laughs> That's a little on the nose. The Crop Preserver is an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturiser, whereas the Crop Reviver is a spray-on toner for your balls. Keep your boys from sticking to your leg in this autumn warmth. Finish off your grooming routine with the Plow 2.0, the perfect razor for the finest shave on your face. Because if you're using your lawnmower 2.0, uh, <laughs> I nearly said 2.0. I know. Because if you're using the lawnmower 4.0 on your balls and your face, you're doing it wrong, boys. I just want to clarify: when we say finish off, we mean finishing your grooming routine. The start of fall also marks the start of Testicular Cancer Awareness Month in April. Manscaped has partnered with the Testicular Cancer Society to bring awareness to testicular cancer, men's health, and early cancer detection. Manscaped is committed to raising awareness for the most common form of cancer in men aged 15 to 35 and giving support to fighters, survivors, and families impacted by testicular cancer as part of their We Save Balls initiative. Always remember, check yourself before you wreck yourself. So guys, remember you can get 20% off and free shipping with the code TRUE4020 at checkout at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code TRUE4020 at manscaped.com. Watch the leaves fall and look down upon beautiful balls this autumn. Let's get into the podcast. Hello and welcome to True Footy Podcast 88. I'm joined once again by my illustrious co-host, Daniel H. Busher. How are you, mate? Going good, mate. Yeah. Cruising. It's, uh, it's our first li- uh, podcast for the, the season. We yep. did a pre-season podcast. You, would have, you were in the live stream with us, so this is just your second appearance on the, yep. on the first month of the season. Uh, what's, what's new in Busherland? Nothing too crazy. Just been working steadily, sanding some parts. Yeah? Yep. All right. With Manscaped? Absolutely. Nice. Yeah, uh, this uh, podcast, as you would have seen from the ad, is once again brought to you by Manscaped uh, in the pursuit of eliminating foul balls. And no, we're not talking about baseball. So thank you again to our sponsors. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about, uh, I guess, the first month of the season and what we've learned from it, Busher. What have you made generally the first four rounds? Has it been surprising? I'll say there's been some, like, well, you always expect there to be surprises on your preseason expectations, but it's always interesting what surprises actually are the ones that occur. Because you'd sort of have them in your head going, yeah, that's a possibility. Like, mm. But the ones that really didn't seem a possibility happened and then ones that seemed like a slight chance has happened. That's true. There's, uh, there's so many variables at play when you're looking at how teams will improve. You know, they got young players. Will they uh, improve linearly? If that's a word, it is, yeah. I think. Uh, will they improve in a way that you expect them to? Most likely not. Sometimes they'll, they'll dip down. Sometimes they'll improve out of sight. Uh, the effect of you know good pre-seasons, which we have no insight into going into the start of a year. We have no idea how fit teams are. Uh, and the effect of like coach moves as well, which I think um, is evident from a few teams this year, Bush. Yeah. So uh, the format is pretty um, unconventional. We've kind of had different approaches to how we would go about this podcast and um and we just sort of you know list things that we've learned from the first four weeks of the season you've kind of gone for more of a team based approach. well because i was sort of going with what i said on the pre one so because i'm sort of going to tr- something i want to try and do on the potty this year sort of try and keep as consistent a narrative as possible so i've sort mm. of tried to go base my current narrative off how i set the sort of expectations for the season to sort of keep it all in a sort of consistent perspective, I guess. Yeah. That's, and then I can sort of give opinions based off that, I think. That's a good way to be. That's a, that's a tough thing um, when you're, we're not in the AFL media per se, but when, you, when you're when commentating, so to speak, on, on football, it's like, it's hard not to, to contradict yourself week to week because things change. So you, yeah. you do need to have a, a consistent sort of baseline of what your beliefs are. And, and that's why, you know, sometimes I'll, 
I'll consistently say, you know, this team has underwhelmed me and then um, then that, that will look like, oh, you hate this team because you're always negative on them. And it's like, no, uh, it's, it's just that I'm trying to be consistent with my beliefs until it's proven otherwise. Uh, but yeah, anyway, we'll, we'll go through um, some of the things, I guess. I, before we get into that, I, there was some big news in the AFL world today. Gil yep. McLaughlin has stepped down as, uh, as the CEO of our great game, I think effective at the end of the season. Huh? Been there for a number of years, uh, replaced Demetrio in God knows how long ago that was now. Do you hey. remember the, what year there was? I have no idea. I was sort of, wasn't as young as I think I was, but I was still sort of yeah, yeah. too young to sort of really... Yeah be aware of it good thing we fact checked before this podcast uh, <laughs> but no the, the main point of it is uh, he, he's apparently been wanting to sort of maybe step away from AFL uh, pre-pandemic or yeah. around the time of the uh, pandemic and, and has come out and said he wanted to, to navigate us through this difficult time it would have been a shit time for a CEO to yeah. drop the ball and, and leave but uh, but credit to him what did you make of Gil McLeckland's tenure I was pretty satisfied with him like because there were sort of some question marks with Demetrio I sort of remember when then he Gil come in right from the outset and sort of tried to be, create a clear vision for what he wants with AFL and he sort of done well with what he's done I agree. I like him. I think. I think the Australian culture a little bit is to um, tall poppy syndrome. I was going to yeah. use that phrase. Yeah, it's just to kind of um, you kind of hate the figurehead because yeah. that's just the way we are. And um, but it's a, it's a heavily scrutinised role. I, I think he's done rel- pretty well, to be honest. Yeah. When you he's navigated us through the most difficult time probably since World War Two. <laughs> Um, where they probably was there even a CEO in in 1945 or 1939? Probably I don't not. Know. It was probably just a few heads of the clubs getting together, having a few beers. For, you know, <laughs> what's going on in the VFL? Yeah, at um, that stage. That's right. And so to to get us through not only having a season in 2020 that I think we can all reflect on wasn't too. I mean, it was compromised, but it wasn't to the extent that it was unfair. Um, they did everything they could with the parameters offered. Yeah, and 2021 uh, has been was no easier i'd imagine with the the border restrictions that were in place and then 2022 this year it's more about isolations and and con- yep. close contact rules and how that's going to be fair but i think on the whole we've uh, we've done very very well to to get in the seasons yep. that we have so i think i think he deserves a lot of yep. credit for the that. interesting thing just quickly on the like rules is going to be how they change as the season progresses and how that sort of affects the parity of teams but got hit by harsher rules earlier in the season yeah i mean maybe we can touch on that a little bit like what what do you think is fair if the, if the close contact rules change do you think it's fair on uh, i know i support west coast but uh, they're the most clear example mm. of a team that's been ravaged by it but do you think it's fair that if mid-season we say oh you know close contact rules are changed now if you're a close contact you can still play do you think that's fair what do you, what do you think the afl should do to go Ooh. about that because i don't think it's an easy answer it's definitely honest. not because like it's one of those things that sort of government imposed to an extent because they, they were sort of just going off the workplace legislation in Australia sort of thing where you sort of got to have these standards. Mm-hmm. I guess yeah. the, let's say we foresee a time where in like a month or yeah. two or whatever um, close contacts can play. Yeah. Do you think the AFL should then say oh, it's a free-for-all, you can, you can play as per the government rules or do you think they should keep an eye on fairness and integrity of the comp and say, well, these are the rules we've started with for the first 10 weeks of the year and they should apply until the end of the season. What well, do you think? it's tough because I think their rules are also above what the government rules are because the mm. AFL is like obviously a multi-billion dollar industry. There's other stakeholders involved. So they've brought in daily rat testing, like stuff like, for example, in my family, small business, we're not making people do rat tests every day because it's just not mm. economically viable. Yeah. But for the AFL and the amount of money on the line, those sort of extras are viable mm. compared to what, most business is just sticking to the government regulations are. Yeah. So the AFL sort of have set their own standards. So in a way, it probably would be consistent for them to say, this is the standard we've set for the 2022 season. We're going to keep it consistent, I guess. I think that in the interest of fairness, I think that's the right thing to do. But then you also have to consider, you know, say with West Coast losing 12 players in a week, what happens if that happens in grand final week to a team? You know, and that, that that's not a good result because uh, you'd have a, one team easily when a grand final has completely ruined the spectacle so i don't think it's an it's a simple answer but maybe we'll, we'll put that to the audience as well to, to let us know in the comments how do you think um we should go about what is but, well, inevitably going to be I changing th- rules think finals you can distinguish the rules for finals from the rules for the regular season as long as the regular season's consistency teams okay. have that sort of consistency to consolidate a position in the eight then come finals i think you can sort of apply context around that time because it's back to a sort of an equal playing field other than where you earned yourself in the eight. 
I like that. I think that's um, that's a pretty good solution that you've offered there. I, uh, I would probably agree with that. So we'll have to see what happens. Uh, well, yeah, we'll move on to what we've learned this football season so far, Busher. I did do a video uh, myself on Friday talking about the teams that have surprised me, both uh, in good good terms and, and in bad terms. In the yeah. bad sense of the word as well but um give us one uh thing that you've learned or that has surprised you about this year so far well the probably well because they were my biggest slider well they were my equal biggest slider but i think based on everyone's expectations rather than just specifically mine port adelaide is the biggest surprise of my biggest sliders yeah because everyone sort of probably figured they'd still be about the mark this year they figured all their kids would have that progression they'd have guys like butters and rosy back and healthy but instead they've imploded it seems but there usually is that team in that sort of top four top six that implodes Mm. on a given year yeah definitely i I think the extent to which they've imploded has probably been quite stark and i I think i made the point the other day where the bulldogs have maybe slipped under the radar a bit in terms of having a bad start to the year because port adelaide are doing far worse do you know what i mean they, yeah. they sit one and three and have dropped some winnable games the bulldogs admittedly with a tough fixture they've had melbourne carlton yeah. uh they beat sydney and then they lost to richmond but you'd expect them to have beaten richmond and carlton at the start of the year yeah. so they've they've underperformed a little bit but what's happening at port adelaide seems a lot more severe i think yeah. the watching them play i think i was going to add this as a point that i've probably learned or or at least it's been reinforced has been Port Adelaide have proven how important structure is. And when they've had some injuries, they've, they're missing Charlie Dixon, they're missing Aaliyah Aaliyah, and have missed Clurie for two or three weeks of the season there as well, which is their other key defensive option. Um, when you move that, remove that structure, it can have a, you know, a domino effect on the rest of the team. And they've been criticised for the way they've moved the ball. It's been stagnant. They've had a forward line of Marshall, Georgiatis and Finn Lathan, and it's clearly not having the same effect as having Charlie Dixon. Now, it's an interesting question. If Charlie Dixon is in, in, in that team, how much do they improve? We don't know the answer to that. He though. can't go get the ball himself. No, he can't. Thing. He can't. But I was watching on the couch, and this is where I get a lot of um, info from because I think it's a fantastic show. But an interesting point out of their the loss to Melbourne where they only kicked one goal to three-quarter time, Sam Mays was targeted as a forward seven times by their midfielders and defenders. Um, kicking the ball inside 50, Sam Mays, seven times. Todd Marshall was not targeted once and he kicked five goals a week before, uh, which is quite interesting. So I, I don't know what the what the diagnosis of that is. My probable... They might just trying to be t- trying to target matchups rather than look for their best player. That's just sort of me spitballing. But... Yeah, yeah. My other theory is that they are moving the ball very slowly and conservatively. It actually reminds me of West Coast last year where they just look devoid of confidence and probably um, when they're even dominating possession, they're just not moving it effectively so if you think about it if you're told marshall the number one key forward suddenly in that team you're probably getting double triple teamed every time as well yeah. so their their avenue to goal is stifled because they don't have that like Todd Marshall's not a bad young player, I don't think. Um, I know this, but he's mixed... probably not the sort of guy that can handle a double team. Yeah, exactly. Um, and on the football field, neither. <laughs> but um, no, in all seriousness, Char- he also isn't the same player that Charlie Dixon is. Charlie Dixon is one of the biggest key forwards in the comp. Like, was he two hundred four? Yeah, like something like that. Like yeah. That, yeah, and you know, probably one hundred and ten kilos without yeah. looking at it. Um, so physically. He's much more equipped to, you know, be able to hold his ground and oh, take a grab. Exactly, and, and and suddenly the long ball forward inside fifty, you know, Charlie Dixon has a chance more so than a Todd Marshall, for for instance. And at a minimum, he can bring it to ground, probably mm. better than a Todd Marshall who can't hold his ground and someone can fly across or whatever. Whereas Marsh, uh, Dixon would hold his ground and bring it to ground. Yeah, exactly right. They uh they they moved the ball quite poorly, and and they they were criticised for the long ball inside 50. But I think that's not just... I don't think that's a strategy. I don't think they're trying to do that. I think they just sort of work their way into trouble. They're the number one clearance team, believe it or not. They've got a lot of bulls. Mm. Yeah, as you'd expect, like Wines and Boat come to mind straight off the bat. Power, pepper even. Yeah, that's right. So there's, there's it's a good stoppage clearance team. However, they are... I looked into it. They're ranked 18th for goal assists. And what that means to me is a team that doesn't generate goal assists... It means it speaks to the idea that people are sort of generating opportunities and, and kicking a goal themselves, right? It, yeah. it, it, to me, it implies a lack of structure. The ball's not moving. Yeah. It's smoothly. individual magic. It's individual moments and, and, and stuff like that that's generating scores. So that that just for me just sort of is a little um, you know full stop on on the point that they're they're not moving the ball well and, and structurally there's there's a lot going wrong. But I think it's confidence as much as anything personally, which I think we underrate as a. Um, 
as a football watching community uh, how important confidence is to, to football so. yeah like because in terms of tiers that was sort of the way I did initially they have slidden from like that top four tier to like but I still have them as a chance to make the eight even though on the current rankings they miss out but you'd be silly I still to, think they're a chance you'd like, be silly not to, early days. to give them a chance they've been a very very good team for yeah. the last two years and if they go 0 and 5 then I think that's where they're reaching the territory if you're out of it but yeah. um, and they've got a big game against Carlton this week so that's interesting uh, throw us another one, Bush. Have you? Uh, what is another thing that you've learned this year so far? Well, I went one slide. I'll go my biggest climber, which was St Kilda. They because I, they in terms of tier, they haven't really climbed. They're still in that group for to make the eight. But I just sort of ha- had them at the bottom end of that group. Whereas realistically, it looks like they're at the top end of that sort of group fighting to make the eight. Mm. It's been an up and down year in the sense that uh, yes, they're three and one and, and sit uh, fourth on the ladder, I think. But I think they generally didn't click in the first couple of rounds. Like they got undone by Collingwood uh, because it wasn't a four quarter performance. It took a big second or third quarter effort by the Saints to drag themselves back in. They just couldn't run with um, what it, what was a good Collingwood performance. Then against Fremantle, I was critical of their win because I thought. That wasn't a great game of footy, to be honest. It definitely you, wasn't. Yeah, you agree I with that? I was pissed with Fremantle for yeah. that game. Yeah, it, it felt like they both sides left a bit on the table in terms of um, what they could offer in that game. I thought it wasn't the performance of two finalist teams. But I think it since was then, Max King was just purely the difference. That third quarter from Max mm. King just separated St Kilda from the muck that was Fremantle that game. Yeah, that's true. And that's but they were pretty much in the muck with us if it wasn't for that patch of Max King. Yeah, it demonstrates how important having a... 200 centimetre key forward is who's yeah. um, not only talented but can can sort of accurate yeah and, and make those half opportunities genuine opportunities as well um, they, that was the difference between Fremantle and the Saints in that game even because Tabiner who's the closest thing we have to that but isn't even really that compared to a Max King that's right yeah and we didn't even have him so that was mm. definitely the difference between those two teams so yeah again structure and why like, another reason why I rate them higher than I probably should have yep. well I did in the preseason I've rate them higher now because they have that and their midfield's still very good. Yeah, I think structure is, again, the uh, the common theme here with uh, the teams we're talking about here. Um, yeah, so my point with the Saints, I think the first couple of rounds, they didn't show too much. And then I think since then, they've played some pretty good footy. They beat the Tigers by five goals and then just annihilated Hawthorne. Interesting stat against Hawthorne, right? They scored 142 points against them, right? They only had 46 inside 50s, and that is actually a record score for any team that's had 46 or less inside 50s. So uh, their forward line is efficient, and yeah. I had actually noticed that before I'd even heard that stat. But suddenly they've got genuine goal kickers, like multiple avenues to goal. King is, uh, I think, he's, is he equal with the common? Yeah, I think, yeah he's, he's up there. Yep. If he's not winning, he's, he's equal first. Membry's not far behind him. I think he's around the top 10 with 10 goals. Yeah. So the Kings kick 13. And then you've got these uh, these smaller types like Gresham, I think he kicked four or something like that. Higgins has uh, been a yep. threat. Even he's probably had seven or eight goals this year. Yeah, Higgins. and probably missed twice as many as that. But still, but <laughs> yeah. still, like there's avenues there. And then Brad Hill comes in and kicks yeah. four goals on a half-forward flank and, and um, just shows a different different dynamic when he's thrown yeah. forward and i like that fantasy wise because i p- picked him up as a defender but my forward line's shit so mm. if he gets dual position yeah we're on baby interesting so i think he's like disposal efficiency doubled in that game compared to his, <laughs> the rest of the games he's yeah played he's had year. some howlers this year yeah he was on my bench this week even though he went well yeah that's right so st kilda um we know their midfield is productive but having that forward line who can convert those opportunities is massive and um in, on top of that they're strong defensively as well. I think they're one of the better teams for de- um, like deflecting inside 50. So huh. like scores per inside 50 they concede. They're, um, they're very good at yep. you know, limiting that. So their back line's going well. Their forward line's efficient. Again, the, all these stats are just based on the four teams they've played this year. But there's a lot going right for St Kilda. And um, yeah, they're yeah. certainly in the mix for finals. Would you yeah. agree with that? Definitely. Well, I had them slide. Like in my ratings, I ended up having them from like 11th sort of and that just missing. I sort of had them... Just because there was sort of no one really else to take the spot, I felt I sort of had them bot- fourth mm-hmm. because I felt there was no one really strongly either way and they were sort of the team to put there, I guess, but they could fall out of there pretty quick. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I think a uh, little bit slept on perhaps St Kilda. I think I, I, I highlighted at the start of the year I, I saw the potential and we're seeing that potential again, but they just need to be yeah. consistent. They just need to be consistent. And for for a list profile that is fairly mature, other than a few young guns, they uh, this is the way they should be playing yeah. as well. To be honest, what else you got for me? Any uh, any other big surprises? Well, well, I had Richmond as a bigger slider as well, but 
I sort of had them rated higher than most. I sort of had them mm. making finals this year where a lot of a lot of other people had them missing. Mm. But yeah, I've definitely got them in that missing finals group now. Yeah. I might have overreacted a little when I said they'll win the spoon, but I think they'll be a lot closer to the spoon than making the eight at this point. So you are saying that straight after a big win over the Bulldogs. Mm. So they have been up and down, Richmond. Yeah. You t- you're talking about Richmond, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I, I think I think they've got a bit about them. It's just not consistent enough for me to, to want to put them in the eight. I think I think mm. from memory in the latter prediction, you and I had swapped GWS. Yeah, you didn't exactly. rate the Giants. And I exactly. didn't rate Richmond yep. to the same extent. And to be fair to you, Richmond is comfortably better than GWS at the moment, in my opinion. Um, I, I don't... I'd think GWS is better, funnily enough. Like, really? But the thing is, with Richmond, now, I think they'll still be having... They'll have good games, but I think they're going to have a few howlers as well where yeah. they just come out and just look putrid. Well, they did beat the Giants fairly easily only a couple of weeks ago, admittedly yeah. at the MCG. So uh, I think I think they're going okay, but um, the good, the thing going for Richmond, I think, is the fact that they've actually genuinely invested in young kids now. Like they've They are transitioning. Them. They are transitioning, and they're, they're intentional with that transition. You look at a few other clubs who need to, my club in- included, who need that youth, and, and Richmond have at least identified that and then drafted heavily and they've got some good young guys like Noah Bolter looks like he could be a real gun I know he's already a good player but I just mean the fact that he can go forward and kick four as well that adds a real string to his bow like even Thompson Dowd seems like they're prioritising him a bit Ralph Smith's in that team as well Um, and there's a few that they drafted who haven't actually played yet I'm thinking Tom Brown Gibkiss has been picked Yep, Gibkiss has looked pretty good yeah that's right so no, good for them in the sense that this could be a productive year, even if it's not one that gets them deep into finals. And uh, obviously with Dusty out as well, that's going to seriously yeah. impede their ability to play finals. But I, one thing I actually felt I learned from them, or maybe it's just reinforced something again, is that I actually think Dion Prestia could be they're close to their most important player. Yeah. Because if you look at the, the midfield depth that they have, I've been critical on it. They don't have much. And Definitely. I think he's far and away their best midfielder, depending on how you classify Dustin Martin. I'd probably classify right. him as more of a high half forward, to be honest. Like, you're, they're relying on Prestia more for the initial clearance, that sort of stuff, whereas Dusty's sort of the guy that can run through mm. and create magic. But yeah, he but, needs to be sometimes given the opportunity a bit further downfield to create the magic, and that's where Prestia comes in. That's right. That's right. So the, their midfield is, is a, isn't is strong on paper. We, we know that. Um and, and, you know, Prestia goes down in that game against the Blues and they lose despite winning in the fourth quarter, I believe it was. Not saying he was the difference, but uh, it's just something to consider. He only played nine games last year and they had a terrible year as well. So um, he's one that I think they really, really, really miss. Every every team's got that player that they think they probably rate as important more than anyone. Which I yeah. feel like for you guys, it's probably Brayshaw or Darcy at the moment, to be honest. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, the out, external would probably be Fife, but we'd, I don't yeah. think we're experiencing the issues people yeah. probably thought we'd have without Fife. Mm. But having Fife would help us a lot in the same That's breath. right. That's right. Well, we'll, we'll get to the Fremantle shortly. Um, but, uh, yeah, just to finish off on Preston, he comes in, has 30 possessions against the Bulldogs, and they, um, they win pretty comfortably in the end. So, uh, yeah, that was my learning point from Richmond. Have you got uh, anything else for me? Well, I'm still just going off me That's climbers cool. and sliders, yeah. but another notable one. My last notable climber is Collingwood. Like yeah. I had them bottom four, but now I think they're a serious chance to make the finals. Mm. Like, they've they've further they've progressed further than you would have expected their youth to like, mm. and their old guys are sort of probably by and large refound form. Like Steel side bottoms probably finally starting that mm. slide, but. Pendlebury's found a bit of new life in the back line. Dugowie, uh, sorry, yeah. uh, Dugowie, I actually meant to say Darcy Moore, uh, yep. has been great as Outstanding well. Outstanding in defence. Mayacek is a really good player. I love Mayacek. Yes. Even though he kill, every time he plays Freo, he kills us. Yeah, like, just a very yeah. hard player to defend. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, Collingwood, um, there's no doubt their established players are bloody good. Yeah. like They did a bit of a clean out, obviously, a couple of years ago and drafted heavily, and the kids they've got in look pretty good, in particular yeah. Ollie Henry, um, yep. and we know about... Dacos, both Dacos yeah. brothers, you could probably include yeah, in that. Definitely. Even like McCre- guys like McCreary. Yeah. He's been really good when he was on the park. Poulter as well. Yeah, Poulter. Yeah. Now, the, the, again, another team that's been intentional with their rebuild. And I was critical of it at the time in the sense that I thought, you know, you, with the team that you have, admittedly there were salary cap pressures, but I, I thought it was an odd time for Collingwood to sort of go, all right, now it's draft, draft, draft. Yeah. But they may actually hit a point where their kids are coming on quicker than expected. And then a lot of their good young players like Crisp and Maynard are two others that we didn't mention. Uh, Jeremy Howe. There's yep. still, still football in them. So 
It, yeah. it could pay off. What, what do you think, though? What do you make of their loss to West Coast? Everyone's talking about, you know, there was an amazing effort by West Coast, but what does that mean for Collingwood, do you think? I don't think it means too much. I think when West Coast are, are still team, but when they're at their marks, they can put pressure on most teams in the competition, if mm. not all, mm. like when they're playing their best footy. And I think the Eagles did have come into that game with a bit more confidence, having mo- even though there was no midfield, but mm. pretty much everything else other than the Eagles' midfield was pretty healthy, except your midfield was absolutely depleted. Your yeah. three best midfielders weren't there. But other than that, they were actually pretty healthy, and that guys got confidence from that. Like, even your B-tier B midfielders were getting confidence on they can kick to Kennedy, Darling. They mm. know McGovern, Hearn, they're backing them up. That gives you confidence as a midfielder to try shit that you wouldn't necessarily try knowing McGovern, Hearn, yeah. Doug, and those sort of dudes are back there. That's true. Well, I guess we'll, we will move to West Coast uh, injury course, but just to finish up on Collingwood, I guess what you could take from what you've said is it was a good West Coast performance. Yeah. And yes, on paper, they just lost to a team that's been decimated. But if you look at it in the context of the game, it was a very spirited effort by West Coast. By no means a good day by Collingwood. But when a team can but it's not like 14 a, in, three, yeah. <laughs> when, you, when you have 42 in South 50, score 87 points from 14 goals three, you give yeah. yourself an outstanding chance to win the game. And Collingwood, yeah. their skills inside 50 and yeah. some of the, they just had moments where, you know, two players would collide. It probably yeah. cost them the game. There was, a, there was a contest late in the game where Hoskin Elliott collided with Darcy Cameron from memory. And it would have been a certain goal for Collingwood and it yeah. ended up being a goal to West Coast. So unlucky but yeah. um, it's one of those things I, I'm more saying it so it's like don't hold that game as an indictment against Collingwood mm, sort of thing mm. that's sort of more my point like it's yep, more of a that. blip on the radar rather than nah they're back to the bottom four team that we sort of everyone expected pre-season yep I agree with that um, any other teams and points you'd like to highlight well the other two I sort of had in my sliders and movers they weren't as big but it was like the Bulldogs which is sort of an obvious one they've sort of mm. even though I'd Knew I had them in the top tier, like with Melbourne, but I sort of knew ladder wise they wouldn't be around that mark. But in terms of talent, I had them there. But now I've really probably dropped them into that making the top eight if they're lucky sort of tier. Yeah, so sitting one and three is far from ideal. But again, we are talking about a team that doesn't rely too heavily on where they finish in September. It's more yeah. about how September goes. Um, excuse me, <laughs> just that was a dirty burp. I just had to cover <laughs> up. Sorry, guys. Um, yeah, no, they their results haven't been flattering, that's for sure. I think if I had to nominate a positive for them, though, Josh Dunkley is having a nice little low-key return to form. Um, yep. He, uh, I've got it here. He had 18 disposals a game in 2020, admittedly shortened quarters. 2021 didn't really recapture the form that he held previously. He only averaged 23 possessions a game last year. He's averaging 31 per game so far this year. So that's a huge uh, increase right. in output and in fact if he continues like this it'll be his career best season although it's only been a month winning more clearances he's going inside 50s more and uh, a free agent at the end of the year I believe maybe not free agent actually Wait, let me work out and out of contract is. maybe he certainly so had a on the extension or has whatever. he been on a list 8 years yet probably he was drafted at the end of 2015 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 nah yeah, that's, that's 7 no uh, maybe he's not a free agent then either way yeah. Doesn't really matter. Uh, a big target for opposition teams, I think, yeah. when you look at... Um, How close he was to leaving a couple of years ago. Yeah, and, and the Bulldogs mustn't have that much money to spend, uh. I'd imagine. So, yeah, an interesting one. But with the Bulldogs, I, I still feel comfortable that they'll... I, I think they, they've Enough. benefited... Oh, sorry, you go. I was just going to say, I think they've benefited from other teams looking... Like every team so far other than Melbourne and probably yeah. Brisbane have... St- stumbled yeah. and so the Bulldogs there's not too much behind those teams yeah. but go on I was going to say another positive for the Dogs is the Tim English has mm. finally sort of emerged as the Ruckman everyone thought he could be sort of grown into his body grown into the role and he's sort of starting to fulfil that proverbial prophecy I guess personally I always thought the criticism on Tim English was really unfair I think we forget how young some of these Rucks that are playing already are um, we can't expect all rucks to develop like Luke Jackson um, or Sean Darcy. Even. Yeah, Sean Darcy. Sean Darcy's is more example. the point because him and English were the same draft, and Darcy hit the r- r- board running as an eighteen-year-old, mm. but he was a big, yeah, physically thick big. boy. Yep, um, Grundy started his career well. Nat Nui started his career well, but other than that, most of these guys mature later. So. Gorn's a good example. Yeah, that's right. Uh, had a couple of ACLs as well. But with English, like I think he was criticised. Admittedly, it's because he was in a grand final team. So you've got to scrutinise the team, players that are picked for a grand final side because that's the hero now. That being said, I just thought it was quite unfair, some of the criticism around him getting 
you know, outbodied and yeah. is he a real ruck? He was like, getting played out of position last year as well. Though. They were mm. almost playing him like a forward pocket. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, he's he struggled a little bit with role. But, yeah, uh, at the end of the day, I agree with what you're saying. And it's good to see him sort of start to fulfil his potential. He was a pretty early pick, wasn't he? Like late teens? Yeah, 17. 17, there you go. So, um, yeah, good to see him do well. And he's going to look great in blue and gold next year. <laughs> what else you got for me? You, you mentioned there was another team that you wanted to... Oh, Carlton was sort of another upper for me. It, it pains me to have them going upwards in any sort of direction. But that I have to admit, like... This is the podcast I set up. I'm going to keep an honest narrative. It's not a live stream where I'm just going to bag the fuckers. But <laughs> you cop some criticism for your uh, conduct regarding Carlton on our first live stream of the year. Fuck them. They win one game and they fucking get overconfident. These clowns. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, they won three. To be fair, but yeah. this this podcast has come at a good time for you after they've just gone down to the Gold Coast Suns by five goals. Yeah, it was beautiful. But in all seriousness, what what have you made of Carlton so far? I, I have to say, like. Everything I thought could go right for them has seemed to go right for them. Like, like their spine is just. Kerno Mackay is probably the best one two key punch in the league. Ooh, like, in I'll, terms of forward. I'll raise you with a Tom Hawkins, Jeremy Cameron. But uh, I, 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 yep, touche. I agree with yep, your point. Right. I agree right. with your point. Hawkins yeah. and Cameron, you're definitely right there. My bad. But still, they're, they're close that tier. Yeah. And then, like, even Weedering is a key back, probably all Australian at the moment. And then their midfield, they've actually got depth in that midfield rather than just. Ben Patrick, Clarips, and Sam Walsh reliant. Mm. They've actually got good support from Hewitt, Chera, Matt Kennedy. Yeah, they sort of dudes. They're not relying on guys who. I don't want to be mean, but don't seem like we're probably draft busts. Yeah. Okay. No, I get what you're saying. Like, there, there's a yeah. huge difference now. They've got support. It's yeah. In recent years, it's been Cripps is on fire, but he's alone. And then Sam Walsh was on fire, then he's alone. And now you got. Uh, before Cripps' injury, Walsh and Cripps are playing good footy together. Admittedly, they haven't all been playing every game, um, but certainly not Walsh. Yeah. But yeah, I agree. And I, I, my thing that I learned this year is that Pat Cripps is Patrick Cripps is still a superstar. Yeah. I think it's good to see him return to the form that he was displaying when he looked certain to, uh, certain to win at Brownlow. He's had thirty and three in round one, thirty five and two in round two, thirty one and one in round three, and then a goal and seven touches, and he d- pinged his hammy. Yeah. He's still third in centre clearances this year despite playing, you know, a quarter... Uh, sorry, yeah, most of a game less than people. Less than other teams, rather. But I, th- I agree. I, I wrote down here, the Blues are a different side with midfield depth. Uh, two of the top three clearance winners are George Hewitt, yeah. who's number one, and Pat Cripps, who's three. Yeah. And then you've got uh, Matt Kennedy is averaging 27 touches and four and a half clearances a game. He's a sort of player who had a real resurgence uh, in the second half of last year from yep. memory after being dropped. And um, is now like a regular mainstay and uh, a good pick for fantasy teams as well. Oh, yep, he's a starting midfield in my draft league for me. That's right. Yeah, it's uh, it's obvious to see where Carlton win games of footy. They're the number one team for points from clearances, which I think it was fifty-two points plus, um, or no, maybe that's their average. I can't yeah. remember. Sorry, the context exactly, but they're still the number one team from points from clearances. Although we saw this breakdown against the Gold Coast Suns, obviously. So they had Pitney miss the game and Cripps go down early. And suddenly you take out their biggest strong point from that team. And, um, I mean, you don't want to just isolate one performance and say, ah, oh, no, they're screwed now. But it's just interesting that the, you take away that and Carlton didn't have too many answers against the Gold Coast Suns. They, um, I was watching on the couch as well. Again, they are much smarter than myself. So I do watch that show and take a lot from it. But they pointed out, Carlton are actually one of the weaker sides for scoring from turnovers. So they're relying a lot on their clearance and stoppage game to score. And so there was a lot of bad footage around the way they that Gold Coast just sort of tore them up. So you could put it down yeah. to a bad day. It's, it's a very small sample size. But I think that's probably Carlton's vulnerability at the moment. Um, but as you say... That makes me happy because apparently that's Freo's biggest strength. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Well, you need to have a good turnover game. I think we've seen that. Yeah. You can't just rely on, on clearances, especially when you know you have an injury and, and it looks yeah. a bit more vulnerable. But um, but I think all the things you say about Weedering being a great key back uh, and then having the spine, an elite spine, or yeah. potentially elite spine in uh, Mackay and, and Kerno. They've got all the tools to be a very good team. I just think they probably just need to tweak a few things, to be honest. And, yeah. But, um, yeah. But for the early days with Voss, they're sort of probably ahead of schedule. 100%, yeah. Hurts me to say. 100%, yep. Hurts me to say because they're a bunch of Vizzy slippery gypsies. <laughs> I think it's Vizzy, isn't it? Yeah. Is it Vizzy or Vizzy? I call them Vizzy, but... Yeah, I actually don't know. We don't really deal with them as much over here on the West Coast. Yeah. Speaking of the West Coast... 
Let's talk about the West Coast Eagles. Ooh, I like that segue. Um, one thing I had learned that I already knew, but I was reinforced, is that Willy Rioli is one of the most underrated footballers in the country. I yeah. honestly think so. And uh, he's averaging 15 possessions and just under three goals a game. And when you're a team that's been, you know, beaten in mo- or three out of four games, that is an outstanding effort. And he's had no midfield really to supply him. He, he's he, had to play midfield yeah, to supply yeah. himself. That's right. He, I mean, he, he actually played a fair bit of midfield before he got suspended for two years, huh. um, which people maybe forget. But he actually covers the ground quite well for, you know, dare I say it. A, a portly fellow. Port, he's a portly young man, <laughs> um, at least by AFL standards, not yep. by general standards. But I think he was running like 16Ks a game like back uh, in 2019. So he, he's a great runner. And he is just a match winner, I think. Yeah, he's I, a point of difference, like X-factor guy. Mm, I think he's starting to get a bit more of a, uh, a profile now yeah. uh, he's, he's in the media a lot at the moment because of his you know potentially three vote game but uh i just wanted to shout him out yep. i think the eagles are a better side than last year that's another thing i've learned i'd agree like i test certainly mm. i test i'd agree yeah so the what i'm talking about is intent and game style because last year particularly the second half we had a solid first half of the year last year but the second half was just... We just looked impotent, dare I use that word. <laughs> um, we looked flaccid at every contest. Um, no, but like tackling numbers were down. Pressure... We've always been a, pre- a poor pressure side, and that's fine when you're controlling the footy and controlling play, but uh, we weren't doing that last year either. We're making a lot of mistakes, not using the ball well. This year it's different, and I don't know whether that's a genuine... Would you say <laughs> Willie was a bit of a blue pill? <laughs> <laughs> I would say that, yeah. Yes. A little you know, blue pill. Don't think you're referring to the Matrix there, are you? <laughs> um, yeah, just in terms of... I don't know if it's a necessity or philosophy change. I'm inclined to think it's maybe a bit of both, but I think you add a couple of midfield coaches in, Matthew Knights and particularly Jared Schofield. Jared Schofield oversaw like, you know, Subiaco being the Weapons. strongest waffle side, I think, ever. Um, and then going to Port Adelaide and, and doing great things with that team there. Success follows him. And now I'm starting to see, even though we're a one and three team, you're starting to see the foundations of what could be a very good team. In my, yeah. in terms of the, like... The next iteration of the Eagles. Yeah. You see promise in it. In terms of the way we play, I, yeah. I know that there's issues around young talent. I, I don't deny that. But um, I, I just think the way we play is a big improvement on last year. And I do wonder as well whether adversity has galvanized us a little bit in the sense that... Mm. Last year, morale was really low. I think there was talk of like infighting a little bit, um, and it would have been a pretty miserable place to be in the second half of Sick last of year. Sick of quarantining and yeah. all that sort of shit. That's right. Whereas this year, we've got, you know, with all the outs, we've got a, a fairly young, unproven group who are banded together through the adversity and the expectations off their shoulders, which is the first time that's been the case for oh, yeah. maybe since the start of 2018, funnily enough. Yeah. And I, I think it's, you're really starting to see us play a much better style of footy. Um, and the pressure rating as well, nominate was uh, we were 18th last year, we're 7th this year. So we really are playing it differently. And I think, I don't want to, I'll be really silly if we get annihilated by Sydney, which is possible. But I think I'll give us a chance this week, even with no Nat Nui, because I just think if we have some midfielders who actually can win a few clearances, we, uh, we've got a chance of displaying what we're capable of. So. Excited. I got I got another shout out I'll give in relation to the Eagles. Patrick Nash, he's taken his opportunity by both hands and ran with it. Mm. By both hands and a pelvic thrust. Yeah, he's been yeah. fantastic. I was going to yeah. nominate him later um, and talk yeah. about some of the recruits of the year so far. Yeah. For for a guy who was at St Kilda and Richmond. Sorry, so you're right. He went. To, he was at Richmond and yeah. then he trained with St Kilda. Okay. And the story was he. Couldn't wasn't given a guarantee from the Saints. They said, "Oh, we haven't decided whether they're going to offer you a contract." Apparently, as it goes, uh, I read this on Big Footy, so I know it's true. <laughs> um, the The Saints expected to give him the contract Monday morning at training. <laughs> he didn't show up. They called him and said, "Where are you? I've got the contract in my hands." And he says, "Oh, I'm flying to Perth." <laughs> so he, because of that lack of insurance, yeah. he obviously uh, went to Perth and trained there, and um, you know is killing it as an eagle. And I think. Right. For, from St Kilda's perspective maybe a little bit of a, a blow to them unfortunately bit of a Hugh Greenwood situation <laughs> yeah a little bit I mean yeah, these things happen it's not a, it's not yeah. a massive deal and he, he's not an A grade midfield or anything but I, I genuinely think yeah. he's, he's going to be a good AFL wingman and yeah he'll amazing. earn a 
he's earned himself a long term position on a list. Mm. Yeah, the way he mo- uses the footy is very impressive. I think it's something we've lacked since maybe Jeddah. I remember really rating him as a prospect back in the draft yep. stages. So I think the criticism of him was perhaps his contested game. He's undoubtedly an outside player, but I think uh, he has the attributes to, to still do well in a good team. And mix it up. So, yeah, I like that shout. Um, have you got anything else, or should I just keep going here? Keep going at this point. Yeah. All right, let's talk about your boys yep. for a minute. I want to say that Andrew Brayshaw has arrived as Ooh. a A-grade genuine gun midfielder. Yeah, he's starting to shake the tag, which has been a pivotal thing for him. So, well, this is the thing. Like, he's tied for uh, second for coaches votes with McGovern. Yep. Shout out. Um, and Mitch. and he's yeah, <laughs> and he's been the clear choice for opposition tags. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, he because he, he is sort of a guy who can affect him a bit with the tags. Yeah. yeah. But despite that, he's averaging thirty a game. He's getting more uncontested outside ball. Mm. He's getting more inside fifty. He's tackling more. So. We saw a little bit of a um, improvement at the end of last year. We were like, oh, this guy could actually be an All Australian. This year, I think he's arrived, and he yeah. had his career best game against St Kilda in terms of possessions, uh, averaging forty. Yeah. He, he just seems like the guy who can lift his team on his back, which I think is uh, was going to yeah. prove its weight in gold. Have, um, I was going to say, how close is he to being your best player? Do you think, as a fan's perspective? Ooh, he's close. I'd still probably sort of have. Couple of guys probably ahead of him, like Sean Darcy, still probably a little bit ahead. Couple like probably back. Couple of the backline guys that are just really good defenders, like a Luke Ryan, but just does his job perfectly. Sort of, even though Brayshaw is sort of better than him as a footballer, obviously. But yeah. in terms of the job and so role for the team, Luke Ryan in our backline is he's telling guys where to go. He's yeah. half the reason Brennan Cox looks as good as Brennan Cox does. It's because he goes. Yeah, he styles his hair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> probably does. Yeah, probably. Are they close? Yeah, they yeah, live together. Mates. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, good shouts, good shouts. I, th- yeah. I think Brayshaw is very close to that number one, though. But I, yeah. I would have nominated Sean Darcy and, um, and probably Luke Ryan pretty close behind that yeah. as well. So, uh, yeah, fair, fair enough. Uh, just on Frio, how have they lived up to your expectations this year? Have they underwhelmed you like they have that, some other fans? Well, I kind of get the underwhelming thing because I have felt that. But the more I sort of look into it and the more it progresses, I've sort of come back to earth of rating them like because after the Adelaide game even though we won I was just that despondent after that mm. potato-ish third quarter from Fremantle it was the most Fremantle thing I've ever seen in my life <laughs> and I just went for fuck's sake another year of this shit mm. and then it's sort of taken them a few weeks to sort of shake that off because the St Kilda game didn't help they, no. like we said it was the Spud Bowl 2022 earlier it's pretty much how we described it I don't think I use those words, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we said it wasn't a good game of football. Yeah, yeah definitely. So yeah, then I still was pretty pessimistic. But the a like the Eagles game, like even though it was the Eagles and they were decimated, we did what we were supposed to. So that sort of mm-hmm. made me feel a bit better. Mm-hmm. And then I came into the GDW, GWS game thinking we get smoked, but they did a good. They played the best game of the year in that game, I'd say. Yeah, I'd agree with that. It sort of took them to the last quarter to really shake them off. But um, the uh, Giants have been a really disappointing yeah. team for me. I know we're talking about Fremantle, but um, I think... In terms of talent, though, I still sort of rate the Giants where they're at. I agree on talent. I think what they've produced this year has sucked, to uh, be honest. But, um, but yeah, so you guys like, sit... Th- the other thing with us is like the style, even though like I haven't been as convinced by the results like on the field, but like the process and that sort of stuff's looked outstanding. Like Even the Adelaide game, we looked great other than that third quarter. Mm. And the other thing that's killing us is the accuracy on goal. Yeah. That's our Achilles heels accuracy on goal. Otherwise, our scores would be a lot higher. Yep. And we'd probably be even... Yeah. I sound like a broken record, but it's just it's it's still with the goal kickers. That's yeah. it. It's it's the guys who can turn half opportunities into goals. Um, you know, I, we talked about Max yeah. King. I think uh, Tom Hawkins is another player like yep. that. Oh, again, we're probably talking about two of the best in the game. Yeah. But even look at a Josh Kennedy. I know he's been a superstar... He had five possessions and he's 35 years old. He had five possessions and kicked three amazing goals because you just give him two of them from outside 50. You give him half a chance and they kick a goal. And that's what Fremantle lack. Definitely. It's turning these half opportunities into goals. And when that happens, suddenly, you know, you you start to look a lot better without that much improvement, if that makes sense. But I was watching, I think it was a clip, I think it was from off on the couch, but it was like they were talking about Freo's turnovers and stuff. Like, we were number two for scoring off turnovers behind Melbourne. You're number two in my And our defence is number two as well, like for opposition scoring. Mm. And that is one thing I've 
always known with Fremantle is our defense is probably a top two or three in the league. So when you're saying it's your defense is number two, you mean it in a good uh, way? Yeah. Okay. As in has... opposition scoring is like oh, Melbourne okay. hold their opponents to the least points, we're second least. I'm making a poop joke, goddammit. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. that's true. That's true. And I think the, the runoff halfback has been a feature at, yep. at times. Um, and I We've th- kind of prioritised it a little more in like our naming of like a team. Like we've sort of gotten three sort of pacey guys like Chappie, Young, mm. Jordan Clark, and then sort of your more locked down traditional guys like a Lukey Ryan, Cox, Pierce, Logue yep. type of dudes. Cox, Pierce, that sounds painful. Oh, yeah. Will Brody has been uh, a pretty good recruit. Yep. And I'd, I'd, Blake Akers is a player that's probably surprised a few. Do you agree mm. with that assessment? I've heard good things from fear fans about Akers. He's been better this year, Akers, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. Brody has been a very pleasant surprise, though, considering we sort of basically took him for a sal- Gold Coast salary cap yeah. dump. Yeah. They gave us basically the best pick mm. other than a first round of that you can have. Yep. Just to take him off their hands. And it turns out he's a cracking good player that was worth the top 10 pick they invested in him a few years ago. That's right. Yeah. No, I agree. And might even make the Lockie Weller pick two trade not even the worst trade Gold Coast <laughs> have had with us. That's a good point. That's a very good point. It's hard to beat that, though. Oh, yeah, probably um, doesn't beat that. So we're, we're moving on uh, in time a little bit here. Um, so we'll probably I'll probably just rattle through the last four fairly fairly quickly. I've got a few points here. Yep. Um, I will nominate Josh Rochelle, best yep. player of the 2021 draft, question mark. Ooh. Big call, eh? Big call. Very big call. Nick Dacos has been I agree, outstanding. Yeah. I agree. But what I will say is that I think Adelaide have nailed this pitch. Yep, they you know, did. They were talked about as needing, and you said this as well, they needed that A grader on their list who could maybe a bit of a game changer rather than just a, a good, solid, defendable yep. type. When you're looking at their rebuild, who who are their game breakers? Who are their yep. degoeys? And I think they found one in Rochelle. Oh, yeah. 16 disposals and two and a half goals a game for a side that's, you know, <laughs> losing. <laughs> Kick five on debut. And um, yeah, generally yep. speaking, he's probably... I think if you had to pick a rising star right now, I think I would go Rochelle if you had to award it right now. I know Dacos Ooh, has been yeah. really good, but they are different role players and Rochelle's never going to get 30 in a game playing the role he does uh, and I think he's executed unbelievably well yeah I gotta say because I I took Rochelle as like cause my draft theme in my mm. fantasy draft has been like youth and project yeah. on youth because I was sort of spec, speculating a bit but Rochelle is one guy I had he had a rough couple of weeks so I ended up actually trying to sneak him in to spec, out to speculate on someone else and then he had the big game this weekend where he turned up again I was shitting myself because I was bottom of the waivers. So, like, yeah. I was basically had to make sh- hope no one else in my league picked him so I'd get him. No one else picked him and he's back on my team. That's outstanding. That's I just sent the boys a message. I'm like, how the fuck did you let me get Rochelle back from bottom <laughs> of the waivers? What are you doing, fellas? For a medium forward in the way that he is to be scoring well in fantasy in his first four Especially games. Especially because forwards are so hard to come by this year in fantasy. Mm. Yeah, that's like, true. Defenders. Not too hard to fill. Mm. Like, you expect it to be hardish, but forward this year has been so hard to get mm. consistency in. Well, I've got a few as we take a little tangent there. I've got uh, Kenilio, Dunkley, Trelaw, and Will Brody are all forwards. Yep. So they've gone well for me. And Rochelle and uh, God knows who my last one is. I'm more talking draft where you can't sort of, yeah, yep. where there's only one of each asset. Good sort point. of hard. That's to, a fair point, uh, actually. Yes. It's okay. a hard one to get a good lineup. Well played. Um, next point. Uh, speed round Nick Blake he could be an all Australian defender and who would have seen that coming especially when, he when he's drafted. drafted as a key forward yeah. originally and he, he always sort of projected as this type where he could play multiple roles that's yeah. for sure I think they talked him up as a midfielder at the time but uh, his output has exploded this year he's averaged uh, 21 when he averaged 14 last year uh, his rebound 50 is a six and a half a game he's doubled his meter get, meters gained and uh, you know he, he's quick he's got dash and he's number four in the league for bounces as well so yeah. it just shows that he's, he's really putting that speed he's sort of even use. playing like that third tall isn't he rather mm. than necessarily as a key kind of like yeah that's yeah. right and sort of like a lococious a little yeah. bit in that type so um, yeah I've, I've really liked what I've seen of his game um Mitch Lewis will shout out. I think Hawthorne yep. may have locked in their key forward. I think that was a criticism I um, of their l- list that I maybe we have made, uh, yeah. and I think it wouldn't be unfair to say most that. people didn't rate him. Well, we just it's more not so much that I looked at him and didn't rate him. It's just that you know the the number one key forward prospect was pick eighty eight, and then Kaczynski mm. was a late pick as well. Rookie wasn't he, Kaczynski? You might be right. You yeah. might be right on that. I'm not too sure. But regardless, the, he's playing exceptionally well for a pick 88, and that's looking like one of the uh, the draft steals of, uh, of a few years. 
Oh, yeah. Equal third in the common. He kicked 22 from 14 last year, and he's already halfway to beating that. He's number one in the league for contested marks and third for marks inside 50. So just a little shout-out to him. Won't make yeah. any big calls about his future, but I think he, he's a long-term AFL Yep, player. he's earned himself a potential 200 game. Yeah, yes. yeah, which is a great effort from that late in the draft. Fucking oath. Are coaches overrated, Busher? Ooh, it kind of... I say that with tongue-in-cheek, to be honest. They're not overrated. Definitely sort of not, but like... It, you can kind of see where ultimately it depends on the talent in the park, but at the same time, like I think they may be overrated on match day because what I'm what I'm, my yeah. premise here is that they I think they're four and zero or five and zero maybe four and zero. Oh, the caretakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because on the match day, due to COVID protocols, um, game day coach hasn't been there. I remember. 2018 it might have been uh, Simpson wasn't there we won yeah uh, Jamie Graham's undefeated 3-0 and was a caretaker coach yeah, they yeah. won at West Coast 2 with us now I feel like Brendan Bolton had a few wins when he was a Hawthorne head coach for a little while uh, yeah so I think it's interesting that um, it's, I, I'm not really making any serious point here it's just uh, funny that you know uh, you, you can't use that excuse because they, they seem to win I, th- I think their match day influence is yeah. Probably not what we think it is I think like a head coach is just sort of more like the guy that ties everything together I think Maybe it seems like it's more the line coaches where mm. that structure and routine comes from rather than the head yeah. coach. The head coach is just sort of the guy that comes and gives the rev up speech and just sort of manages how the free line coaches sort of operate. But it seems like the line coaches are probably where the brunt of club's genius and structure could be coming from. Yep. Uh, I think I reckon you would find it will probably vary from club to club how involved the coach is in strategy and stuff like that. But I, I have heard Simpson say um, that... On game day, he, a lot of it, what happens is up to the players. He said that, and right. uh, in terms of guiding what happens, even tactically. Um, yeah. Admittedly, the Eagles are a mature side, so it's a lot of senior mm-hmm. players yeah. out there. It might be different for a young club, but you kind um, of give them the system, and then the players sort of can use their knowledge of the system. And go, okay, today we need to do a blitz or that's a right, sag yeah. or whatever you call your players and shit like that. And you think about the reduced influence of runners as well. So the coach, yeah. the players really are on their own out there to some extent until they come off and speak yeah. to the player or uh, to the coach. So, yeah. Uh, all right, we'll finish off with a, uh, a quick one. Uh, who do you think has been the recruit of the year so far? And this can include draftees, it can include SSP um, or trades. For me, I think when you consider recruit of the year, it's not just best player, it's, it's also the value, the value that you yeah, okay. of them. In terms of value, I'm going to have to be a bit biased here and go with Will Brody considering the fact we were gifted pick 19 to take him in the salary cap we had anyway. I think with the criteria I set then you can only give that to Will Brody because you guys got more than you... Yep. You didn't give anything up, really, did you? What did you give up? We gave up a future second. Yeah, okay, and got pick 19 and Will Brody. So yeah. you got Will Brody for free. We so got the best two assets in the trade. Yeah, <laughs> so that's, that's so funny. Uh, fair point. In terms of value, yes, Will Brody. Uh, George Hewitt, I think, has been a, a yep. very good value, a number one clearance player in the league right now. Jordan um, Dawson's another yep, shout. Yeah, Jordan Dawson. Admittedly, uh, what he, I forget what he cost in the end, but... Um, yeah, he was a first. Yeah, like late first or something, yeah. or shuffling of picks. I can't remember. Um, we will nominate as well the, the, the draftees we mentioned. Dacos, Rochelle, I think Horn Francis has yep. done a really good job. Uh, Josh Ward has been solid as well. Uh, Nick Martin, in terms yep. of SSP player, uh, five goals and 27 yep. touches, made a bang. And uh, for us, I, I'll Patrick say Nash. Yep. Nash has been like quite a handy player, like genuinely yep. contributing to our... To, uh, <laughs> Four yeah. A's forward. Even another one, Hugh Dixon. Like, even though he's not been pre- very productive, but he's just sort of been a guy that's come and done his job for you, considering you got him off the garbage heap, sort of thing. Yeah, happy with Dixon. I think. I think in terms of. <laughs> <laughs> God, I'm mature. Damn it. <laughs> um, I think in the context of recruit of the year, it's not part yeah, of this conversation. Not, but but uh, I agree that we have done well with those picks as well. So. There's more a shout out. But a yeah, nod, I'd say on that one. Yeah. No. Who else? Anyone else? Who else has been a good recruit? Uh, Lipinski started well yeah. uh, for the value that they gave up for him. Um, I'm trying to think. I yeah. think there's someone I'm supposed to be thinking of. Probably. It's yeah. probably someone really obvious. Yeah. I just listed a few that I'd thought of. Yeah. Uh, but I think for me, it's yeah, probably Hewitt so far, I think, yeah. in terms of uh, consistent output. And he was a free agent and they only got like a future. Sorry, they only got a second rounder for him. So yeah. um, that's my shout. But yeah. yeah, let us know in the comments your nominations because we're kind of drawing yeah. a blank after that, after the first oh, yeah. eight players there. Um, but yeah, that's it, guys. That'll probably do us for a True Footy Podcast 88. 88 mate. Yes, keep the countdown to 100. I wonder when we'll, we'll do our 100. 
I'm going to Europe, by the way. Oh, baby. I'm going on June 13th. Shit. So, yeah, no, a month of no content. Sorry, guys. But uh, that, that'll be a setback in the, in the podcast thing. But, yeah, maybe 100 will oh. be next year. Oh, nice. uh, well, yeah, we normally get like 10 or 15 out a year. Yeah. Maybe it's a bit more than that, actually. But, yeah. We'll make it a New Year's Eve or something fun. Yeah, that'd be funny. Yeah, yeah. we'll have to just jam in a few <laughs> podcasts to, to yeah. bump it up to 99 and then we'll do New Year's. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you guys for watching and listening. Don't forget, we're also on Spotify if you prefer to listen to these podcasts um, and stay tuned to the channel. Uh, I'm hoping to have this out by Wednesday, so we'll probably do a live stream Easter weekend at some point, maybe. And uh, other than that, just stay tuned to the channel. Thanks very much, guys, and we'll see you in the next one.